I was down with no way up and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free.
the ups and downs of a lot of believers. And he told me there's a problem. God said there's a problem. I'm going to talk about that problem today. And let me not get too far. Let's go into a word of prayer first. And then I'm going to go right to the word of God. Let's pray. Father God, again, by your own miraculous leading and guiding. Somebody's here who was probably on their way to death. Somebody here who the enemy tried to take out. But they can celebrate this morning. Not only that they're still here, but they're still here and better. Somebody's watching this morning, Lord, that needs a word from you. Somebody's watching that needs to know that you are removing the obstacles and the struggles out of their way. Lord, I ask that you would calm my mind. Please, God, you come and preach your gospel. You be the one to speak the word, Lord. Bring back to my remembrance everything you said. But get your glory. And let someone know that there, this is a, every time your word is read, it's supernatural. Every time your word is read, uh, demons have to run. Things come together. Healings take place. So today, Lord, we release all of that from glory into this time of relationship and communication through the word. Amen. Go with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. Someone says, ah, I know that verse. No, you don't know where God is taking us today. 1 Kings chapter 19. I'm glad I got some Bible folk here who know what chapter we're in. But watch what the Lord says to us today. I'm reading from an A, uh, American Standard Version. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elisha had done. And with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elisha saying, So let the gods do to me more also if I make not thy life as one of them tomorrow. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. And he said, it is enough. Now, O Jehovah, take my life, for I am no better than my Fathers, we're going to, I'm, I'm going to give you my, my text in a few moments, but let me, let me start this message so you can understand what, how God is bringing us into an understanding. Go with me, see Elisha desperate, see Elisha, we've, been, we've all been there, see Elisha at that moment, think about your midnight hour, and you'll understand where we are going. I'm going to start this message with the Tuskegee Airmen that those great African American pilots who represent well the battles that we have had to overcome just to get equality in our country. Um, talking about this after the George Floyd verdict is also appropriate because it shows how resilient we are and the fact that we are still having the fight to get equality. The movie Red Tails is a 2012 movie by George Lucas that tells the story of the Tuskegee Airmen. It is not a documentary, it's an action movie that actually tells the exploits and what they did and what they accomplished from the 332nd uh, Fighter Squadron, uh, all black fighter squadron. If you saw the movie, you know it was, a, it was an excellent movie, it was an exciting movie, because the movie also touches on how they had to uh, fight enemies abroad and fight enemies at home, and yet they were still successful in what they were trying to do. 
um, these airmen were able to showcase their talents in a world where the ideology of the War Department was, watch this, the War Department said, black pilots are not smart enough to fly airplanes. The War Department said, no white people want to fly with black pilots. And the War Department said that blacks are too docile to hold together in an air fight, in air combat. And yet these black pilots took the opportunity to uh, racism and bigotry and turn it into an opportunity to show how strong and successful they could really be. Someone said, how did they do it? If you saw the movie, I was really taken with the, the tenacity of each one of these pilots, right? And how they did it was they painted the nose and the tails of their plane red to distinguish them. Don't always try to be like everybody else. Uh, that way, they thought that they didn't have to give them any honor or recognition, but they painted their planes so they would stand out. And then it was their fight uh, theme, their fight song, their fight slogan before they went into battles. You might have saw that part of the movie. They got together before they went up in the air with all the pressure that was going on around them, and their slogan was, to the last plane, to the last bullet, to the last minute, to the last man, we fight, we fight, we fight, we fight, we fight. I mean, they would rouse it out till all their hearts were in line. They said, to the last plane, to the last bullet, to the last minute, to the last man, we fight, we fight, we fight. And that is, it gave them courage as they were going through this. See, with the daily stress they faced, they could not afford to get depressed or to get down in self-pity. What they decided to do was not run from their victories, no matter how much pressure was around them. They went on to the next victory. As a matter of fact, they used victory as a stepping stone to the next battle they had to fight. That is the title of this message. Stop running from your victory. Stop running from your victories. They didn't run. They had pressure to run. Even after, they, even after they had a victory, there was so much against them, but they kept on fighting and believing in themselves. And we as believers got to take that same attitude into the spiritual warfare that we have to fight. Don't look at me. I'm talking about the fight that you have to fight in your own battle. Listen to me. You got to get to the point that you hear yourself echoing. We fight, we fight, we fight. And you got to believe that I will not find myself in a position of defeat. I'm finding out there's too many believers who are getting victories, who, who, who have a reason to worship God, who know that it's miraculous that you're over here. You're right, you know that it's a miracle. We may not know, but you know what you fought through. You know that midnight hour when the devil tried to take you out. You know that time when you should not have gotten back up. You know that moment when you said, I'm definitely leaving here. But somehow the anointing of God brought you back, blessed you, and here you are now. And yet from that victory, you run to a place that God doesn't understand. What are you saying God doesn't understand? It's inexplicable. I, I can't explain it. It's part of our fallen nature. I guess that's what it is. But watch this. And you can't explain it. And you've seen it just like I've seen it. I'm not the only one who's seen it. Uh, uh, explain this to me. How can you go from a vibrant life of service with God on fire to a place where you are now miserable? How can you serve God, trusting God, uh, go to church every Sunday, whether it be virtual from your house or uh, your church is reopened and you're back in your church. How can you do that every week and then be scared of your own shadow the next week? How can you get to the place that you're shouting, trusting, giving God all you got? How do you go from there from shouting and trusting to wanting to commit suicide. How do you go from a place where God has given you, taken you out of your old life, given you a new life, and then as soon as trouble comes, you go, you resort back to that same stuff that got you in trouble in the first place. And how do you get to a place watching God sustain your life, build you up, bless you, watch me. How do you get to a place where you say, I've had enough. I can't take no more. It's too much. How do you do that? It's inexplicable. But today, Elisha
scripture in this text. They're going to show us how people got there. He got there. Elisha was a great servant of God. He was a man who served God and did God's bidding. One of the greater prophets showed up on the scene with power. You know how we do when we come into this salvation thing. There's some of us, we've been running and will not turn back. Elisha was the one. You could see the anointing in his life. How did he get to the point that he did not get up from this failure? Because Elisha had just come back from defeating the prophets of Baal under Jezebel, the priestess, giving victory for God in front of the entire nation, and yet, instead of using that victory to get stronger, instead of standing on that victory for the thing he's going for now, am I talking about Elisha or you? Instead of using and thinking back to your victory, instead of understanding the power of your victory, you, the text tells me, he ran. I didn't say that. I know the first time you read this text, you were kind of like me. Why in the world would Elisha run after all that power? That's the same thing God is saying to you. He ran. Not only did he just run, if you look at the second verse of our text, it says, when Jezebel, Ahab told Jezebel what Elisha had done, and then she said, uh, may the Lord do more to me or make me like them if I don't make you like one of the prophets you slain by tomorrow. May the Lord do more to me if I don't make you like one of those prophets you slain by tomorrow. And the Bible said when he heard that threat, he ran. The text didn't just say he ran. It said he ran for his life. It was not a misprint. It was not a mistake. I read it. But is that the same Elisha that was just saying, God be God, serve him? Is that the same you that was just shouting, God be good to me, child? Is that the same you that was on your knees talking about how saved you are, how blessed you are, and let me tell you how God healed me, let me tell you how God blessed me, let me tell you. And then all of a sudden, you can't get up from the next trial. Why are you running from your victories instead of trusting God? And not only is it inexplicable, you need to understand something. Elisha forgot, and many of us do, he forgot several things about his walking God. Please don't forget the God who never forgets you. At times, I'm not the only one, doesn't God have to shake your memory and say, what are you doing? But you know who I am? Elisha forgot the fact that we don't ever have to go crazy or think about suicide because God always gives us a place of rest. I'm thinking about one of my favorite scriptures, Matthew 11, verse 20, well, 28 to 30, says, Come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, burden, pressure. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly, and you shall find rest for your souls. Watch this. My yoke is easy, and my burdens are light. Here's what God's invitation says. God is saying, don't run. And if you do run, come to me. I'll give you some rest. While I put you back in. Somebody here right now, you're going through a mental problem you don't have to go through. If you would just find yourself running in God, getting in God's presence, and remember God's presence is already there for you. God is saying, I'm over you. I'm taking care of you. But you have to remember that God's presence. Elisha for God. Why am I going crazy when I can find rest in God like I did before? Elisha forgot that he had been changed. I love the fact that I have to remember that I'm not that old person that the enemy used to push around. Sometimes the enemy will give me the same push, but I got to remember that I'm not that same person. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 15 says, and this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of which I am chief. Come on somebody, where are the sinners like me? Where are the folk that will be able to tell you, yeah, I was a big sinner and that's why I know, I know I've been changed. I know God has been in my life. Anybody want to testify that you know you've been touched by God just from the things that you've been able to overcome? You know that you've been touched and blessed by God. 
And surely Elisha forgot that we don't create our future. God creates our future. Philippians 1, chapter 6, being confident of this very thing. He who has begun a good work in you will continue it until the day of Christ. God said, I'm never going to stop working. That's good news for somebody. Come on, celebrate me. Comment right there. So I put it in the chat that, you know what, Pastor, you just reminded me that my future is set. That's a praising point right there. My future is set. So today we're going to talk about don't run from your victories. How are you going to have a victory and then run because another problem came when you just got a victory? Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Three things I'm going to lift off this text. I'm going to talk about understanding why you run. Thank you, Elisha. Understanding why you run. I want to talk about understanding the way you're running. And I want to talk about understand what God does when you stop running. Understand why you run. Understand the way you're running. Understand what God does when you stop running. In this text, Ahab is the seventh king of the ten kings of the north, and he was the worst one of them all. Ahab found himself marrying Jezebel, a Phoenician princess who also was a worshiper of Baal and Astaroth. Ahab, the king, allowed her to turn his mind into serving Baal and Astaroth. Do you know Jezebel got so bold she was going to make that the new religion of Israel? Just move God out of the way. Matter of fact, she had guilds of priests, 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Astaroth, and she built these uh, uh, guilds and she built these places where you could go and worship these false prophets at the high places and Israel was falling for this after the God who had delivered them. And then God sent Elisha. Man, was he bad. He popped up and he said there was going to be a drought. After the drought, he went back and said the drought was over. Jezebel wasn't around. He said, let's have a contest so we can see who was king. That was verse chapter 18. But in chapter 19, as soon as he got the message from Jezebel, he Ran. Let's look at it. And they had told Jezebel all Elisha had done. Verse 1. Verse 2, we've already talked about. Elisha got the message from Jezebel. I'm going to do the same thing to you by tomorrow. Third verse said, and there he ran with Bathsheba. Bathsheba, you know what's really funny? He left his service there. When you start running, you start losing your mind. Why are you running when you got a God who's able to keep you, has kept you, and is blessing you. But here is why you run. The first thing we have to see is let's get into Elisha. Let's, be, let's not be hard on him yet until we understand what he was doing because I can tell you there's some Elishas listening to me right now. You got to know that after you have a victory, there is a period after a victory called the period of disillusionment. It is when this victory is letting me know I am saved, everything's okay. Come on, you've been there. God is good. We on top, high five. God got this thing together. We are blessed, blessed, blessed. But you ought to know that we forget that ecstasy is going to be short-lived because right after that problem comes another problem. Come on, help us somebody. There's another problem that comes right after that. Instead of getting ready for the other problem, we become disillusioned and we run instead of being set because here's what happens. We never prepare ourselves for something bad. We always, in America, try to avert. We, we Christians believe as long as I'm saved, I can't avert trouble. So nobody wants trouble. And you find out when the trouble comes, you're not ready, and you run. Here's why disillusionment came. Elisha thought that after the people saw what God did, that they would embrace him as a hero. Ahab would tell Jezebel, you got to go. And yet, the script flipped. The people flipped on him. The king flipped on him. He told, he gave Jezebel the power to chase him. Can you imagine how disillusioned Elisha was when he said, I thought that you would embrace me as a hero, but it didn't happen. Come on, before you hard on him, understand, all of us have been to that place where God, I can't believe this is happening right now. Come on, have you ever been there? Uh, not, not from here, God. Uh, no, no. Here, here's what disillusionment is. Let me give you a definition of disillusionment. Disillusionment is, oh, you're going to like this, when what you thought would happen, as long as you've been saved, what you thought would happen 
never happened, has not happened. But what you thought would never happen has happened. That's good. Come on. How many of you have been there? Oh, God, I never thought. This would happen. All my dreams, all my desires are over here. They didn't happen, but I never thought this would happen. And that's what happened. Disillusion. And we find ourselves not able to handle because we tell God, I've been serving you. I'm the one that's been trusting you. Come on, that sounds familiar. God, I'm right here. I never, I, I'm not the best, but I don't let you down. I'm better than some. And I become disillusioned. And with disillusionment, you come anger. And then with anger comes bitterness. But before bitterness comes a fear that God can't do what he's supposed to do. A fear that God can't do. And then I get bitter with God and I run. You know how many of you have been running from one battle to the next, up one day, down one day, right? Because you got bitter. Bitterness takes your power and kills your future. Bitterness. There's some bitter Christians. Lord, I'm going to serve you, but you better get this out of my way. Um, Max Licato in his book, Applause from Heaven, tells a story about this woman. She said, I caught my husband having an affair with another woman. And he promised it would never happen again. And he begged me to take him back, but I would not, I could not. I was angry and bitter. I could not get myself to swallow my pride. I wanted him to pay. I wanted revenge. And I wanted him to pay dearly. I needed my pound of flesh. And the woman said, I filed for divorce. Now, you don't hear her asking God about none of this, right? And the children begged me not to file for divorce. But I filed for divorce. And when I filed for divorce, even... After that, he was begging me to take him back. Two years, he chased me. And I said, no, he struck first. I'm striking now. I'll never give him the satisfaction. I want him to pay. Well, after two years, he gave up. He met a young widow who had two small children. He got married and rebuilded his life without me. I see him sometimes. He looks happy. Matter of fact, all of them look happy. And then I realize, here I am, this old, bitter, unforgiving, lonely woman who would not allow her foolish stubbornness to forgive. And when you don't forgive, revenge is good, but when you don't forgive, bitterness is all you have left. That's somebody. You better quit getting bitter with God because bitterness, trying to get a revenge, sitting there saying, God better do this, God better do that. You better run back to the arms of God. You better allow God to cover you. And remember, this same God was the God that brought you out, picked you up, took you out of the last mess, and you're going to get to the point where you don't forget and you want to walk in bitterness. Know what it leads to? Where we find Elijah. The bitterness so many saints at the day. You are a bunch, you got a bunch of self-pity. Oh, me. Why at me? I'm the only one. That's what leads to the text. Because you don't realize where Elisha went. Nobody is exempt from becoming weary. I just said something. I'm helping somebody. Nobody is exempt from becoming weary. Listen to me, my brother and sister. God wanted me to pour that into your spirit. Nobody is exempt, but I sure did equip you for it. Did, did, you, did you get that? Did you shout that? You're, you're not exempt, but you sure are equipped to handle it. If you get your mind right to handle it, everybody's going to face weariness. Everybody's going to go up and down. Everybody's going to have problems. Everybody's going to have struggles. There is nobody that will not. And in the midst of that, you're going to be so weary. Can I get a witness? That sometimes you don't know whether you're coming or going. The real honest Christians, yeah, I got victory. Yeah, I know the Holy Ghost. Yeah, I speak in tongues. Yeah, I jump all over. But there are moments when I myself am weary and sometimes bitter. And when I get to that point, I want to act like I'm the only one. And none of us are exempt. You know, I remember when I was 
going to the end of my doctorate. I was still a full-time pastor, had a full-time family, serving on other committees, writing, and I was also writing a book. And I did not know, did not believe, did not comprehend that I could be so weary that I would be depressed or at least lose a bit of my hold on reality. Please go with me. Because in the midst of all I was doing, I caught a bug and a virus. And I, and I was able to push everything on that bug and virus. I remember going to my doctor. I got blood tests. Everything was good. I was taking my medication. But my mind was in that state of, I don't know why this happened to me. My mind was pressured by what I was going through. I'm making a confession here. Watch this. And I went to the doctor one time. I'll never forget, my wife's sitting there. And the doctor said, well, you know, we just did the blood test. You're, everything's gone. The virus is gone. I said, no, doc, I need medicine. You don't know. I still feel this. Something's going on. And I remember, I'll never forget the look my wife and the doctor gave me. And I had to reinforce them, guys. I'm telling y'all, I know me. Something's going on. So the doctor sent me to a specialist. And when I got in there, this woman, she didn't pull no punches like my doctor. She said, there is nothing wrong with you, Mr. Duncans. You just have to quit thinking there is. What? Yes, you're fine. You now have to force yourself to understand your fine. You know what happened? I was headed on the road to healing, but can I tell you it was not easy? I had to change my mindset. You don't know how strong our minds is for making us think one thing is happening when something else is happening, and in the midst of all of that, we forget God. And I had to fight to get back to a place of healing. You think I wanted to admit that something was wrong with me? No, sir. Do you think I was? This is where the resurrection, the supernatural resurrection power of God comes in. God is telling us we never get victory in ourselves. Victory comes from our relationship with God. It comes from Jesus paying the price on the cross. Stay with me. That's why you don't have to worry about your victory because the victory was won by God. You just have to grab your victory. You just have to hold on to the victory. Think about Pastor Paul in that third chapter of Philippians. Now, you know, Paul, he, his, his handkerchiefs heal people. He wrote scriptures that send chills up our spine. We see Paul uh, coming boldly for God, standing up against all idolaters and people getting saved. And Paul was a powerful man of God. As a matter of fact, in the third chapter of Philippians, he gave his pedigree. He gave his bio. He said that um, circumcised the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, uh, touching the law, zeal, blameless. Go, go look up his credentials. He gave his credentials. But then he said in that same third chapter, but you know what? I count all that as nothing. I had that and I was dying. You better talk to me, somebody. You had all that before you came to Christ. Why would you go back to that when that was what you were using before God got a hold of you? He said, no. And then at 10th verse, he told us where he did his power. If you ever want to know how the Apostle Paul made it, how you make it, how I make it, how all of us make it, is in that third chapter, the 10th verse, he said that I may know him and the resurrection of his power. Be made conform unto his death. Going in the likeness of his suffering, that I may know him, that I may suffer like him, that I may be conformable to his death. Here's what he's saying, that I might die to me and live to him, let his power carry. Right now, your problem is, you might be right where I was, you're in your mind instead of in God. And I got to, Paul said, that's how I got victory. That's how I made it. The resurrection power. Then he went on to say, and I press. Which takes us to the second point. Elisha was running. Understand not only why you're running. We just found out why he was running. He was disillusioned. You know, he didn't realize everybody can, everybody's going to be weary. And then it tells us the way he was running. you got to catch this. But he himself went a day's journey in the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested himself that he might die. Requested that he might die. Where he was running, watch this, this is something. When you run away from God, you automatically are running into a wilderness because you're off the path of your destiny. Things are going to get worse, not better. 
When you run from God, there's a certain mindset you have to have in the wilderness. Because here's the good thing. Even when we run to the wilderness, God will keep us in the wilderness. But we can't go in the wilderness like Elijah went. You know how Elijah went in the wilderness? Already given up. He said, I've had enough. Take my life. He had the wrong attitude to try to survive in the wilderness. The wilderness is not an enemy to a child of God. As a matter of fact, we got some wilderness shouters out there that will tell you, I came out of the wilderness, and when I came out, what I learned blessed me. Where are those folk at that will tell somebody, I'm proud of my scars. I'm proud of my struggle. My struggle makes me who I am. I know now that God can keep me because I've been in the wilderness, but when I went in, I went in with the right attitude. I learned how to sing in the rain. I learned how to shout instead of cry or shout while I'm crying. Come on, go with me. I learned how to worship God when everything's falling apart. I learned how to pick up the pieces and give them to God. And when I can't pick them up, I stand still and let God pick them up. I learned that I will make it in the wilderness. If there's anybody in the wilderness today, I'm telling you right now, I decree, I declare that God's going to get you out of the wilderness if you keep your mind together. But he had the wrong mindset going into the wilderness. The wilderness can be a place of deliverance or a place of dying? Place of provision or a place of lack? Remember when the children of Israel were in the wilderness? God should have gave them up. He let them go 40 years, but all 40 years he provided. The reason they died, because their attitude wasn't right for the wilderness. Elisha wasn't ready for the wilderness. That's why he said, let me die. He forgot about his victory. In the wilderness is where Jesus actually literally overcame the devil in his weakest state after 40 days of fasting. Please understand the significance of that. When you're going into the wilderness with God, it doesn't make a difference if you're weak, if you're falling apart. God's got your back. And Jesus defeated the enemy in the wilderness. We got to have the right mindset for the wilderness. There was... Um, a man tells a story about his best friend who had a heart attack, who was a Christian. He was kind of a mean Christian, but he was a believer, and he had a heart attack. And first they thought he was going to die, but then he got better and he made it. But he noticed he was a changed man. So he walked up to his friend. Crazy question. He said, uh, how'd you like your heart attack? And his friend said, hey. He said, would you want another one? He said, No. He said, would you recommend it to anybody? He said, no. He said, um, but you and your wife have always had a good relationship, but is your relationship better since your heart attack? Sure is. How about your children? My children and my grandchildren. Want to see a picture? Um, how about how you treat other people now? Do you treat people with more respect and more patience? And are you conscious? Uh, of how you treat them? I sure am. I've learned how special people are. How about yourself? Do you take care of yourself better? I make sure. And the most important question is, how is your relationship with God? Oh my God, my relationship with God is so much better. And at the end of him saying all that, he said, well, I'm going to ask you again. How would you like your heart attack? And the man said, I didn't like it, but it sure did do me some good. Can I talk to you? How do you like your sickness? How the hell did I get in the hospital? I didn't like it, but God sure was in there with me and got me out. How do you like the fact that you were broke and didn't know how you were going to pay your bills? I didn't like it, but I sure watched God pay them. Come on, you see this thing? How do you like the fact that you were fearful and falling apart and full of anxiety? I didn't like being like that, but I held on until God changed me. What I'm telling you is the wilderness can be a blessing if you hold on. If you understand why you're in the wilderness. Quit trying to run out of the wilderness. It's a place of blessing. Scripture tells us in the wilderness we can learn to count it all joy. James chapter 1 verse 2. Count it all joy when you fall into darkest temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith works patient. The wilderness can make me a more patient person who won't have to run every time the devil 
pushes. The wilderness can make me a person that grows stronger because 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, excuse me, chapter 4, verse 16, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 tells us, for this cause we faint not, though the outward man perish, my inward man. Come on, where are the folk like me that have seen the inward man stand? You didn't know how you were going to get through your trials, but you did. And finally, it'll make you more practical. You'll learn how to say there is no temptation taking me, but such is common man. I start thinking, if my mama can make it through this trial, so sometimes you got to do that. Sometimes you got to look at somebody who you think is, man, I know they're not strong with me. And you got to say, if they're making it, I know I can make it. Because that's what you have to understand. The way you're running is to the wilderness, but you got to turn the wilderness around by your attitude and trusting in the power of God. Let's get out of here. You see Elisha sitting under the juniper tree, crying, stop for a moment, and God shows up. I like the fact that as soon as I stop running, God shows up and speaks to me. Because it's in the wilderness where God's presence really can get into my heart. The wilderness will make me accept some stuff I would not have accepted if I was on my feet. And all of a sudden, the last point. Watch what God does when you stop. As soon as Elisha stopped, God began to minister to him. Did you see that? So when you stop, you reignite that relationship. Elisha wasn't ready yet, but God said, I have sure been waiting on you to stop running, stop worrying, stop crying, and just stand still so I can minister. And the Bible said, he sent an angel, gave him food, told him to rest, let him sleep. Then he showed up, and he said to Elisha, come on, follow the text, you see it in the text. He, as he saw him there, he said, Elisha, what are you doing here like this? Verse, verse 9. It's verse 9. Yeah. What are you doing here like this? Here's what he said. Not you. If anybody should be saying it shouldn't be you, not the one that was praising me, not the one that I got out, not with all the things you overcame. You've been through too much now to be sitting here like this. Matter of fact, if I could translate it, what God was saying is stop running from your victories. You got too many victories to be crying now. You're not going to be taken out. You're not going anywhere. God is with you. Stop running from your victory. And then Elisha said, well, I'm the only one left. He still wasn't ready yet. So God said, go and listen. Go out there. And then, you know, God came in the fire. God came in the wind. But he wasn't there. Then God came in a still, small voice. I like the fact that God says, I'm not coming on your terms while you whining and acting up. You got to stop. And if you listen below the trouble, below the pressure, you'll hear my voice saying it's going to be all right. I've got you right now. Go, shh, listen, he's talking to you right now. I'm already here with you. I've already fixed the situation. I've got you. God showed up again. And Elisha still wasn't ready. But God said, Elisha, it was the last time. God changed his tone now. What are you doing here like that? You haven't stopped running yet? He said, this is what I want you to do. Like, so I got, I'm the only one, I'm the only one, I'm the only one. God said, no, no, here's what I want you to do, Elisha. God didn't, even, God didn't even address that question yet. God said, I want you to go and anoint this one king and anoint this one king, and I want you to go find Elijah, and I want you to, you know, bring him into your house as a prophet. He said, and then I need you to understand something. I got 7,000 more people that have never bent their knee to Baal, neither kissed his face. You know, when they worship, they would kiss their little statues and they would just give it. He said, I got 7,000. Why are you sitting here whining, missing your victory? God said, if you stop running and remember that you're redeemed, if you stop running from your victories and remember you have victories, if you stop running and remember how blessed you are, then you would never, ever, ever have to see yourself in a position where you're saying, I've had enough. Let's close. Everybody needs to hear this. God spoke this to me so clearly. He said, why are you worried this time when I just brought you through that time? Why are you struggling now when you can look back 
there's, there's some healing in your past. There's, there's some late night blessings in your past. There's some nobody loves me. There was times when nobody else was there for you but me. Quit running from me. Not after you had a victory. Remember, you're redeemed. Elisha went back to work. It wasn't long before God raised up another prophet. But at least Elijah came out. And because he went back, he was able to meet his destiny and get caught up in a whirlwind chariot. My brothers and sisters, there is destiny in you. Right now, God told me to tell you, stop running. Aren't you tired yet? You got too many victories to be worried right now. Remember, you are redeemed. As Pastor Duncan saying, if there's somebody here, we, we need you. While I'm preaching, I want you to chat. You know, when you, Please chat while I'm preaching so I can know you're getting this. I got some folk that'll take a look at it. But if this has blessed you, and I feel an anointing, somebody here needed this so desperately. Stop running. He ain't failed you yet. Stop running. You're not going to go down. Please join us. Go to YouTube. Go to Facebook. Like our page. Go to YouTube and subscribe. Come on. Go to Instagram and subscribe. Help me get this word out to someone. Have a great day. When you're going through this week, and you come weary, and you become weary, tell yourself, I'm redeemed. I'm not running. I got too many victories. God bless you. Take it to him and leave it there. I was down with no way up, and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free